When I was a kid, I collected these very odd trading cards called the Weird and Wild cards. They were basically attached to some sort of bare bones trading card game that I never really got to play because I'm just assuming that not many people own them. But each of the cards also came with these rather large infographics that I really like to collect and stare at for hours on end, giving my autistic leanings. <laughs> uh, they had creatures like the Weir Tiger and the Wyvern, but they also had stuff from Norse mythology like Jormungandr, which I'm fairly certain I just butchered, and even creatures from stories like Moby Dick. But one card that stuck out in my memory and has been with me for a good portion of my life has definitely been the Chupacabra card. I was just always fascinated by its visage and the short history lesson that the card gave me about this weird alien-like creature who ran around Latin America sucking the blood of livestock and scaring the shit out of locals. So today, I thought it would be fun if we sat down and took a little history lesson on the chupacabra its origins where it came from and whether or not it actually exists spoiler it doesn't <laughs> our story begins way back in the ancient year of 1995 <laughs> yeah i was shocked too the the chupacabra was big enough p creature of folklore to be introduced into this card series that I just told you about, but realistically, the rumor started when I was two years old. <laughs> I mean, I'm 30. I just turned 30 this year. That means that this is literally less than 30 years old as a mythos and as a legend. The story goes that out in a town, the town of Mocha in Puerto Rico, a mass amount of livestock were found with their blood drained. These were originally attributed to the El Vampirio de Mocha, or the Vampire of Mocha in Puerto Rico. But there were also kind of thoughts that this might be attributed to a satanic cult. What prompted the invention of this new creature, nobody really seems to know. I looked up and down, watched various documentaries, and tried to figure out exactly why people decided to attribute this kind of killing to a creature. And the only thing that I can really think of is that human psychology is a crazy thing. Whenever we see something that we can't really explain or that we don't really understand the meanings of, we will often try to attribute it to something that is supernatural or unrealistic. This is part of the reason why so many myths and legends tend to be created, and it's actually one of my favorite things about myths and legends, how we invented them to explain the unexplainable. But many eyewitnesses reported seeing an alien-like reptilian creature with huge claws and spines that traveled down its back with large fangs. But interestingly to me, they didn't describe it as having wings. And the more that I looked around, the more I couldn't really find a descriptor of the creature with wings. The reason I bring this up is because that infographic that sparked this entire video has the chupacabra with wings and even describes it in the text as having the wings and flying around. But I can't really figure out where this came from. My only guess, I guess you could say, is that possibly it came from the idea of the Mothman, which is another mythological creature that I'll do a video on later down. But perhaps the creators of this card combined the ideas of the Mothman and the Chupacabra together and ended up giving this iteration wings. And this is more fascinating to me than the actual Chupacabra history because it's really interesting how in just a short amount of time, the idea and the myth and the legend of the Chupacabra started transforming depending on the iteration that you were looking at. What's also very interesting to me is whether while this did start in 1995 in the town of Moca, Puerto Rico, it also began to spread as far north as Maine, United States of America, and even across the ocean into Russia and down south into the Philippines. The idea of the Chupacabra became so widespread so quickly. Typically, whenever sort of mythos like this tend to pop up, it takes hundreds of years for it to build and its legend and its status to start wandering around to different areas and inspiring new folklore. Interestingly enough, we don't really have very many descriptions outside of the original alien-like bipedal appearance, but in the United States, it's often described as a canine um, on, that walks on all fours, quadrupedal, I think it's called, um, and it's still got the spines along its back, but it doesn't have the large fangs, and it also doesn't seem to have the large claws either. It's mostly just a weird-looking dog. 
Now, this has been attributed to the dogs, the wild dogs of the United States that tend to have mange, which is a sort of tick disease that removes a lot of their fur and makes them look very foreign and uncanny valley-like. The chupacabra gets its name from two Spanish words, chupa, to suck, and cabra, goat, directly translating itself to goat sucker. This term was first coined by, Sil I'm going to butcher this so bad, Seville, Sevilla, Sevilla, Silverio Perez. Sorry, Silverio Perez. And while all sources agree on the statement that this was the guy who termed it, he was a he was a comedian and entrepreneur. Um, nobody can kind of figure out why or where. I can't seem to find any sources that state where he first said it. Like, did he do it in an interview, in a stand-up special, in a book, in a on a TV show, in fucking Morse code? I don't know. I can't find any sources that tell me when and where he brought this up, but he is agreed to be the one who came up with the idea. There's actually surprisingly very little information on the chupacabra. Now, I get it, the story is less than 30 years old, but I would think that with all of the various sightings across the world that maybe we would get more legends and myths about where this thing came from. The biggest source of information that I could find was a book by this guy Benjamin Redford called Tracking the Chupacabra, where he investigated by going and talking to eyewitnesses in the uh, early 2010s. Now, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get my hands on the book. Uh, I don't have the money to purchase it right now, and my local libraries all seem to be out of it, so it was very difficult for me to actually get a hold of the copy. But I was able to find uh, some, snips, uh, some snippets here and there on the internet for like kind of demo reads, and I did end up getting to the conclusion, and it seemed seems that Benjamin actually ended up concluding that the reason that the eyewitnesses described the Chupacabra as they did was because of a 1995 movie called Species that came er earlier that year, and a creature in it called Sill, which I have a feeling I'm going to have to censor when I throw the image up on screen. But if you compare Sill to the images of the Chupacabra that we normally see, you can see the vast similarities between the two creatures. The very odd, hunched over bipedal form, the reptilian-like appearance, the spines down the back, the large claws. The only thing Sill seems to be missing is a large pair of fangs. But interestingly enough, I think that the large pair of fangs was only attributed to, to the injuries that were on the livestock that were found in the 1995 incident. You see See, over there, they said that all of the livestock had been drained of blood, but multiple investigators determined this to not be the case. They had some blood out of them, but it was more akin to the way that you drain blood from like a butcher shop. There were terms of in there were talks of very odd injuries, but nobody could ever seem to agree what the injuries were. Some described three round puncture holes that were very small. Some described two triangular puncture holes that were kind of bigger. Some described one large puncture hole. Some described two small round ones. It's all very different and it jumps from person to person. And I find this incredibly disappointing because I was really hoping that when I was going to go diving into this video that I was going to find more stories and more origins and more myths. But what the Chupacabra is and what its various um, motivations are or maybe how it could have been created or whatever the case may be just seems to completely and utterly vanish from any kind of speculation on people's parts. And again, I know that this is attributed to the fact that it's less than a three decade old myth, but it's also just kind of weird to me because the way that we learned about the Chupacabra growing up, or at least the way I learned about the Chupacabra, was that it was a very old myth and legend that was passed down from generation to generation. Somebody like Paul Bunyan or John Henry or Sasquatch or the Loch Ness Monster, these larger than life mythological creatures and people who were like modern day folklore um warriors. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. The point is, is that I really expect there to be more to the Chupacabra than there actually is, but as it turns out, there's not. Now, the question still remains, is the Chupacabra real? And no, it's obviously not. We've not found any evidence of such a creature. There's been no bones or carcasses or anything like that, and if there is only one Chupacabra and it's still alive somewhere in Latin America, then that doesn't explain the quote-unquote sightings in Russia or Philippines or or Maine, fucking Maine. Um, then again, Stephen King 
is from Maine. So maybe it was him. But the point is, is that the Chupacabra continues to be a myth, but because, but it continues to be a myth that does not have a lot to explore within it. And unfortunately, uh, that is all I have today. But I hope you guys enjoyed this very short dive into the myth of the Chupacabra. If you have more sources of information that I might have missed, or maybe some stories you heard about the Chupacabra growing up, then I would love to hear them down in the comments down below. Um, I also wanted to let everybody know who's been subscribed to the channel for a while that this is the kind of thing that I'm going to be doing on the channel moving forward. It's taken a long time to find my identity as a creator, but delving into fairy tales and folklores and old stories is definitely going to be on my agenda because it's always been part of my, like, um, passions in life outside of comedy, um, and it's just something that I've always wanted to do. So I hope you guys enjoy the new direction the channel's going. Uh, look out for rebranding coming to the channel soon. I love you all so much, and I will see you in the next one.